Okay, CSEP 546, review of the course part two, ensembles. Ensembles is about learning multiple models instead of learning just one model. It helps you deal with the bias variance trade-off where a model may not have enough power to learn the concept, or it may have too much power and it may learn the concept um, in an incorrect way that just happens to be true on the training data. Ensembles lets you get around these trade-offs. There are three main methods. The first is bagging, which we talked about in the first part of the course, so we won't talk about it more here. The next is boosting. Um, boosting is an ensemble method where you learn a model, then you learn another model on the mistakes that the first model makes, or this is sometimes called the residuals. And you learn a chain of models on the mistakes that the previous models had made, and at the end you vote them all. Here's a quick overview of the algorithm. You weight the samples, you do a certain number of rounds, you learn a model, you figure out how much error the model's making, if it's too high you stop, you figure out how many votes you're going to give that particular model based on the error rate, you update all the samples that the model got right to have a lower weight on the next round, and the samples that it got wrong to have a higher weight, and then you renormalize to one. That's a quick overview, all you probably need to know for the final. Stacking is another approach where you learn a set of base models on the original problem, and then you learn a meta model on the outputs of those base models. So, um, so the meta training set has one feature per base model, where that feature is the output of the base model, and the label that it's trying to predict is the original label. It's important when you learn this that you use holdout data so you don't learn the meta model on the same data that was used to train the base models or else you won't generalize well. There are multiple notions of ensembles. One is as an algorithm, which we discussed bagging, boosting, and stacking. But there's also the notion that when you're building a large machine learning system, you're going to have many models built by many different people and you need to figure out how to organize them. Another thing you might use something like stacking for is to allow multiple machine learners to work on the same problem using maybe different modeling approaches, do their own feature engineering and tuning, and then combine them with a meta model. You might also want to use multiple models built by different people, but then combine them with a very simple layer of business logic. Often this is done to help avoid mistakes or to tune for the user experience that you want. And the final thing you can do is just in general, create an architecture where everyone knows how to plug their models in. This is things like model sequencing, model partitioning, and these can be very powerful to keep you from ending up with spaghetti code. So in general, when you're organizing your models, you want something that's accurate, or more precisely, something that doesn't trade off too much accuracy in exchange for the following properties we're gonna talk about. Those are making it easy to grow. So how much work does a new machine learning person who's coming onto the team have to do to figure out how to deploy their first model? loosely coupled so that you can deploy a model without having to also change every other model, comprehensible so you can track down mistakes. When a mistake comes in, you can find the model that was responsible for it or a small set of models that might have been responsible for it, measurable in that you want to know over time, is this model still adding value or is it just adding complexity and maybe we should turn it off? And then supportive of teams so that it's not winner take all. Whoever built the best model gets to ship it and everyone else gets to get a bad review. Then we talked about computer vision. There are a couple different goals for computer vision. You could do classification, where you're trying to identify what's in a picture. You could do localization, where you're trying to identify key points in a picture where you already sort of know what's there. Um, and you can do segmentation, where you're trying to extract a particular entity from an image, figure out exactly where it is and where it isn't. General, when you're doing computer vision, you're gonna have a pipeline of processing, where you'll take a raw image, you'll do some normalization, you'll find points of interest on that image and then crop out the thing that you're trying to do computer vision about or classification or specific localization on. Then you'll renormalize that small piece. Then you'll convert it to intensity, which is another form of normalization. And then you might even do further normalization on those results to get the input into a really nice shape for computer vision. When constructing features for computer vision, it's like a menu. You take the feature you want to extract and the region you want to extract it from and combine them. So the notion of regions are, um, you could go to the whole image, you could do a grid, some sort of regular grid, you could heuristically pick a region of interest saying, hey, the center of this image is important, or you could use localization. 
Once you figured out where you want to extract the features from, you could do things like um, intensity, values, average maximum, histograms of intensity, or you could work on responses to filters. Convolution is an approach for doing this where you have a filter and you sweep it across the normalized image data and that results in a response for each pixel location. There you see that's the response of this edge detection filter to an image that has a very clear edge in it. And you notice sometimes you have to do some padding so you may not have responses everywhere in the output, but convolutions are an important technique for computer vision. We moved on to clustering, and the one algorithm we talked about in detail was k-means. This works by randomly selecting cluster centroids for whatever number of clusters you think are in your data, and then iterating an algorithm where you assign each point in your data to the nearest cluster centroid, then move the cluster centroid's location to be the average of all points assigned to it. This is a lightweight version of expectation maximization, um, and you iterate this a few times, and you'll converge to cluster centroid locations. Um, if you tune the number of clusters you have, you may get different answers, and then you have to inspect the data to know how good this is. You may want to take a moment to remember the difference between L1 norm and L2 norm, and while you're at it, figure out what L2 versus L2 regularization are. The next training algorithm we talked about was k-means. In k-means, you ship your training data into your runtime, and when you want to classify a new point, you map it into the same instance space as your training data, you find the k nearest training points, and then you return the most common label among those, or the probability, the distribution of the labels among those nearest points. This has a disadvantage that you have to ship your training data, but this can be useful for things like looking for comps for your real estate. Somebody from class gave me that sample, thanks. We talked about a couple design patterns for doing machine learning at scale. Um, this included closed loop, adversarial, corpus centric, and ranking based. In the corpus centric version of this, you have to build up your training corpus on your own. You're not able to get it from usage from your customers. This is often very useful to do when the concept you're trying to learn is hard but stable. It's worth investing in getting data because you'll be able to use it for a long period of time. It's also useful to do if you really have no way to get data from your customers, like you don't have any customers or privacy is a big concern. You can also use this to bootstrap some of the other design patterns. One of the main challenges for corpus-centric learning is getting correct labels on the data, and that's not always easy. It can be quite tedious. You can also need a very, very lot of labels. So if you have to, let's say, label a million images in order to get world-class computer vision, you're going to have to have a lot of people sitting around at a tool like this little sketch we have here inputting labels. So you might want to think about what you can do to support their workflow and to help keep errors from creeping into the system over time. Tedious job, but it can be fun because, hey, it lets anyone participate in creating the next great artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of this talk about bias in artificial intelligence, and it's true that every machine learning algorithm is going to make mistakes and that those mistakes will be clustered on certain types of users. But that doesn't mean there's no hope. You're empowered to go out and find critical populations of your users and get special training data that lets you evaluate how good your model is for them. So if you're not doing this, you're doing machine learning wrong at scale. And next time somebody says, oh, there's bias in your AI, no, nah, no, nah, it's not bias, it's just laziness. So go out there and create a proper test matrix for your machine learning model. And think about when you're deploying that you may not want to set thresholds on the global performance, but you may want to set it on the worst subpopulation that you have. The next design pattern we talked about was ranking. Ranking is commonly used um, for search engines, for digital assistants, for helping users create content, a whole bunch of different applications. So the user does a query, which could be some text that they type in, or it could just be an implicit query, like they've written a paragraph, and the system wants to help them figure out how to make that paragraph better. Comes in and it gets interpreted, and then it gets sent off to a bunch of query engines. And these are subsystems that can take the content and give an answer that is somehow relevant or somehow an improvement on that context. Um, they could be query engines for text-based web pages versus image versus local search, etc. Basic query engines themselves could be thought of as rankers, but you need a meta ranker that decides whose answers should we show to the user in the limited spots that are available. 
There are a lot of ways to evaluate ranking algorithms. One of them is mean average precision. It's a little bit different from traditional machine learning that we talked about in the first half of the course because here each training example is a query combined with a set of documents with their labels. In this case, the labels are A, B, C about which topic they're relevant to. So the way you execute mean average precision is that you run your algorithm on all the documents and score them. Then you sort them by the score and then you calculate the precision at each point. So if you take just the highest scored one, what's your precision, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a little bit more to this process than just that, but you end up with an average precision score for a particular query. If the ranker put everything relevant at the top, the precision score is gonna be one. If it put everything relevant at the bottom, the precision score is gonna be crummy. In this case, it would be 0.18. And then your mean average precision is averaging this value across the entire test set that you have. And again, remember where each test set is a query and a set of labeled documents for that query. You need to determine where your models are gonna live. And there are pros and cons of each, you know, how quickly you can update them, how much it costs you to run them, will they work offline or does the user have to be online? So some of the places are you could ship your model static in the product where you don't really have a way to update them without updating the entire product. You could have client-side models where the client can connect to a service to download updates to the models that you have. You could do server-centric where the models just live in a server and every time the client wants to interact with the model, they need to bundle up all the features and send them to the server. The server runs the inference and sends the inference result back. You could do your models in the back end, essentially caching the responses to very common queries. Or of course, you could do some sort of a hybrid where you, let's say, cache the most common things, but then on the server run on tail queries that you don't commonly see. Here's the basics of a neural network structure. You have an input layer, which are the X, the features. Then you have one or more hidden layers where neurons process the input. Then you have an output layer where the network combines all of its thoughts on a particular training example and produces an output for you. Uh, output layer can have multiple outputs for different concepts and can do classification across all of them simultaneously. Here's an example of doing predictions with a neural network. Here are the, here's the input layer with your features. Here are the weights of each of the internal neurons. Remember, these are all essentially linear models, very much like doing logistic regression. So this just shows how you would apply that to get the prediction of the neural network. And you should be able to do this if you want to get a passing grade on a final, <laughs> for example. To train neural networks, you use an algorithm called backprop where you first do forward propagation of a particular example to get the error between the output of the network and the correct label for that example. The next step is you back propagate that error back through the network. Based on the various values, you try to assign which portion of that error is which node responsible for and how much is it responsible for that portion of the error. So you back prop and then you do a weight update step where the weights of each node, you know, these things here, are updated to reduce the error that they contributed. Here's a quick summary of the backprop algorithm. You have to initialize all the weights in your network to small values. If they're zero, it's not gonna work. And then while it's not time to stop, you go one training sample at a time, um, do the forward prop, do the backprop, do the update. You want to run until you stop making progress. Neural networks are difficult to converge and will often get stuck in local maxima. So there's a little bit of black magic to getting this right in practice. Then we talked about a whole bunch more advanced neural network concepts. Well, fully connected layers are not more advanced. That's what we just talked about. But we talked about convolutional layers, max pooling, activation, softmax. We did not talk about recurrent neural networks, but they are very important. Just not, didn't show up in this course. There was more of an overview. Talked about embeddings, residual networks, batch normalization, and dropout. We also talked about the concept of patience, where you run your backprop algorithm a little bit past where you think it's converged, just to make sure you weren't stuck in a local optimum. Convolutional layers are similar to the convolution we talked about a little while ago for computer vision. In this case, it's a one-dimensional convolution instead of a two-dimensional convolution, where you take a neuron and you sweep it across your one-dimensional input to get the response. So here's the response, and that's what's passed deeper into the neural network. Of course, you can also do 2D convolutions 
with neural networks or 3D convolutions, for example, across different color channel inputs or other different layers of your data. You can even do 4D convolutions for neural networks. To do backpropagation with convolutional layers, you simply unroll each convolutional node and simulate the act of applying it across the whole input. Um, then when you backpropagate the error, each of these simulated nodes will be responsible for some portion of the error, but you update the same single set of shared weights so that um, it's updated according to the error of all these different virtual nodes. Anyway, that's that trick. Math is very important in machine learning. Every time I say I'm not too into math, I don't really love math, everybody tells me, well, then you're not good at machine learning. I don't know, maybe they're right. But there are some basic math concepts that you really should know walking away from a machine learning course. Sigmoid, log loss, Bayes' theorems, entropy, L1 versus L2 norm, regularization, square, mean squared error, binary, blah, 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 blah. They're all written down here for you. Um, so I didn't tell you which was which, but if you can't skim this and quickly know which is which, you better go look through the slides and try to figure it out. Reinforcement learning is another interesting setting for machine learning where you have an agent interacting with an environment instead of sort of a fixed training set. This has some very different properties like um, delayed rewards and where the agent itself is picking what training data you want to have for the system. A simple version of reinforcement learning is when you can model the environment as a Markov decision process. That is, the agent interacts with it, it gets a new state, and it gets a reward associated with that state. Um, there's a discrete time, so each action happens one step after the next. It's not a continuous process. And there's a little bit of randomness in which state you end up in given a particular action. Important concepts for understanding reinforcement learning are the policy. That is, for an agent, what action will it take in any state? Basically, it's whole program in its brain about what to do with the environment. The goal of reinforcement learning is generally to learn a good policy. Um, and you want to learn a policy that maximizes the expected discounted future reward of following the policy that you have. You can write this as the value of being in a particular state, having a particular policy, is equal to the probability of which state you're going to end up in based on taking the action according to the policy. So it can be stochastic times the reward you get for taking that action from the state that you're at and ending up at the state that you end up at, plus the discounted future value of being in the state that you move to. Q-learning is one reinforcement learning algorithm for learning policies, and in a particular setup, it is guaranteed to converge to the optimal. The rough approach is to have the agent randomly interact with the environment according to its current policy, um, receive feedback from the environment to, from the actions that it's taken, and then update its expectation. This Q function is its expectation of the value of taking a particular action in a particular state. And so as you're exploring, you update it based on the rewards that you get and your expectation of the value of being in the state that you end up at. Slightly more complicated, watch the lecture if you need to know what that means. Um, the exploration policy here is, what does this look like? Go back to the machine learning math, and if you can't identify what that is, maybe you should study a little bit more. Machine learning systems live over a long period of time. You probably are using machine learning because you're dealing with a hard problem or an open-ended problem or a time-changing problem, and that means that you're not just going to deploy it and walk away. So orchestrating is about how do you build a system that it's easy to run over time so that the quality of the system stays high day after day after day and doesn't start degrading the moment you ship it. Successful orchestration needs to achieve the objective to balance the forcefulness of the experience, the frequency of the experience, and the quality of the intelligence, mitigate mistakes, scale efficiently, degrade slowly, and you might want to invest in building tools to help the people who are doing orchestration. On being Bayesian, here's another piece of the machine learning math that if you don't instantly recognize that, you should study a little bit more, or you're gonna go for an interview. You're gonna say, you know machine learning. They're gonna put a machine learning person on your interview loop. That person's gonna draw this on the board or ask you to draw this on the board. You're not gonna know what to do. And then they're gonna say, who taught you machine learning? This Jeff Halton guy is terrible. So please learn this so I don't end up looking terrible. It would be, it would be really bad. Then a quick review of a few concepts from the first half of the class. There's this map estimate, and if I could pronounce that word, I'd say 
maximum mm, instead of just saying map. But here the idea is that your estimate is based on what you see in the data and your prior expectation over what is going on in the world. So remember the example is you flip a coin and you're trying to estimate whether the coin is biased or not and you might have an expectation that the coin is not biased. So you would encode that when you're making your final decision about what's the probability that the coin is gonna come up heads. An alternative to that is to do what's called a maximum likelihood estimate, ML or MLE, where you just base your estimate on what you see in the data and you don't bring any prior knowledge to bear. So, okay, now you're gonna leave this course, you're gonna go back to your job, they're gonna say, do machine learning, and I just want to walk through the steps that you should think about when approaching a machine learning project so that you can be really sophisticated about it. The first thing you need to ask is, do we need machine learning at all? Make sure that the problem is hard enough to warrant it and that it's gonna be a good investment over time. Next, immediately, before you start doing anything else, define what success looks like. Make sure you have the right model properties to optimize and the right user outcomes to optimize. Some sense of how they're gonna to tie to your business objectives. Design a user experience to achieve your goals. And what that means is you wanna create a closed loop between usage and your model and start thinking about how to close that loop very quickly. Because the next thing you need to do is figure out how you're gonna cheaply get data to train the model and starting with the experience will be a great way to do it. Next, you need to verify that your intelligent experience is working. This is a little more tricky than verifying that a traditional user interface is working because Machine learning models always make mistakes. Then you need to decide where your intelligence is gonna live. Is it on the client? Is it in a server? Is it in the back end? And you need to design a runtime to execute your intelligence. You need to plan for how you're gonna roll new intelligence out, whether it's through silent rollouts, ramping up, or doing flights. And then you need to plan on how to get telemetry back so you can make sure your model's working as you expect. You're gonna to need to evaluate your intelligence and make sure you're not lazy you need to decide how to organize your intelligence so that the team of people working on it can collaborate effectively. Then you need to set up the intelligence creation process so that the modelers can reproduce runtime exactly. You're gonna to want to plan the orchestration so that the system won't degrade and that you'll be able to keep it in a good state over time. You're gonna to want to figure out how you're gonna identify mistakes proactively from looking at telemetry, but also from getting feedback from customers. And if you build something successful that's interesting to abusers, they're gonna show up. So it's good to think early about how you're gonna respond if they do show up. But most importantly, have fun. Machine learning's changing the world. I open the newspaper all the time and I'm like, a machine learn, well, <laughs> I don't use a newspaper anymore, but I, I pick up a tablet and read some news and I'm like, computer can do what? All sorts of incredible things, and often that incredible thing is because of machine learning. After this course, you should be prepared to get involved in those types of projects and really contribute. Building models is one way to do it, it's an important ingredient, but I think by now you should know that there's a lot of engineering and management that has to go around those models to turn them into a success. So you should all have more than enough to get involved and help change the world. I really look forward to the day where I open a newspaper, I say a computer can do what, and I see one of your names there. That would make me very happy. So anyway, thank you. Couple things you could do for me, please keep in touch. Let me know if you're using machine learning and if you have success or if you learn any lessons that maybe I don't know about yet, I'd love to hear about it. And send me constructive criticism about the course. You know, I don't wanna cry, but I do wanna make it better. If they're foolish enough to invite me back again, I wanna make sure the next set of students has an even better time than you did. Anyway, thanks again for everything. I've really enjoyed it. Peace.